Thanks for everyone uh, coming, and it's my distinct honor to be here today uh, to uh, present the winners of the uh, second annual Pritzker Poetry Contest. Um, we, uh, Maggie, Nolan, Rebecca Levine, who were graduates of the class of 2012, uh, and I started the contest um, back in uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and the reason why we started it is because um, being in private practice, uh, one of the things I see, unfortunately, over and over again is that there's a certain amount of cynicism that develops uh, once you get out into the real world. Um, and it's one of those things that, uh, you know, has been discouraging. Um, there is no doubt that every doctor, especially to the medical students in the audience, is going to face challenges in their life um, with regard to bad outcomes, uh, complications, the stress of the job itself. Um, a medical litigation. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of challenges that physicians face, and I think that uh, in order to maintain your compassion and maintain your your just choosing to be really good to your patients is something that uh, unfortunately I don't really see. So, in other words, uh, one of the things that that we wanted to do is to try to foster that sense, and that's, that's why we started the Pritzker Poetry, the Pritzker Poetry Contest. Um, I. Uh, we had over 100 entries this year, which was pretty spectacular. Um, and it was something that uh, it was very popular among the, uh, uh, among the students. Um, and we actually opened it up to the entire Chicago land, um, to the University of Chicago community, uh, which is pretty special. And um, I wanted to thank the judges for taking the time to um, um, put this uh, together and evaluate the, uh, evaluate the poems. I also wanted to uh, give a special shout out to Josh Williams. Uh, and Dana Levinson and um, to uh, Jim Woodruff, who really kind of uh, took so much time and energy to put this together, and it really kind of is a testament to them. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and uh, have uh, each person read uh, their poem. Uh, why don't we start out with the, the six word poem categories. Um, is Dr. Ginny Fleming here? I just want to uh, say two things. First, that I co-wrote this pro pro poem with my brother. We were sitting at dinner, and I said, well, if we can win this contest, we'll use the money to go visit each other and see each other's kids. So uh, like compassionate care, it was a joint effort. And the second thing is that if I had known Dr. Rubenstein would be here, I would never have entered a poem and poetry contest. left <laughs> over from my days as an intern. But in any case, um, alone, I see darkness. Stay near. All right. Um, our next, uh, uh, the, the winner of the contest uh, of the open. So before I go on, I'm sorry, this is the, the first time that uh, we've actually recognized the winners in public. So I apologize for the hiccups here. Um, the, the poem, the contest is divided into two separate uh, poems. So there's a six word poem, which you just heard. Uh, and there's a, um, an open poem where basically people can just write about whatever they want that's going to foster compassion. So the winner of the open poem this year was um, uh, first year medical student, Lindsay Poston. And if Lindsay, if you could uh, come up and um, read your poem. Congratulations. Um, so the poems are actually in, um, in, the, in the program on page six, I believe, so you can actually read along. Yeah. When Mary stood scrimmage, for falling days she was the crown, and days she sang the morning star, with a voice that rang strong and clear as the morphine drip, now pinned through thin water, thin enough to show the two bones. Belly scars inscribe a life of babies born, then ovaries torn, of kidneys <coughs> lost and gained. And with the newest cut, she's lost a knee that bounced those giggling babes, a leg that danced the days she sang. Where once that pretty <coughs> leg was bent, fresh stitches stretch, flesh bound, bones end. Drip runs dry, the morning star fades. One grandchild on the phone, fighting doctors, calling home, saying three weeks left, unless they carve out something new. 
Amidst murmurs of somectomy, anesthetized, she speaks her plea. They just cut, cut, cut. It ain't nothing new. They just cut, cut, cut where the bad cells grew. Doctor, no. I'm tired and through. One more cut ain't gonna heal. One more cut ain't gonna do. So, Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about the poem and what, uh, you know, tell us what it means to you, if yeah. you can. Um, so I actually wrote this my, after my first day working in hospice as an undergrad. Um, this was one of the first patients that I ever had contact with. And um, I don't know, for me, I think that, that this was really a process of kind of reflecting on, on things that seemed too big to, to make sense of and to be able to put that in. To be able to put that into um, in a, to a poem for me is just kind of a cathartic process. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that medicine and poetry are that different. I think they're both a lot about details and patterns and about using really technical skills and knowledge to relate to other human beings. And they're about finding just a mess and then making sense of it for yourself. And that's what I did. Great, thanks. All right, uh, next uh, winner, the second place winner, is um, research assistant Julie Mosqueda uh, with a poem entitled Maybe. Julie, could you come up? Thanks. Tell us what this what this is about, what it means to you. Uh, well, this poem was actually inspired by my sister when she was in the hospital. I remember a nurse; she was really nice to her, and I wondered like what like she didn't know my sister; she didn't know what she was going through. So I just remember just being so thankful for her. So. That's great. Thank you. Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one other thing, I, I wanted to uh, also. Um, uh, thank uh, Dean Humphrey. Um, without her, I called her a year and a half ago, I actually sent her an email, and she was the one who greenlighted this. Um, you know, all I can tell you for the medical students who are in the audience is that there's just two words that I can think of about her. Forward thinking. Um, she's very eager to embrace new things, and I think this is something that uh, I hope uh, you all maintain your compassion. Um, you're lucky to have her as Dean, you're lucky to be here as a medical student. Um, and uh, I hope to uh, have you guys enter the contest next year. Thanks very much. Uh, our first presenter this afternoon is Dr. Amber Binkiewicz. Dr. Binkiewicz specializes in general internal medicine uh, with a special interest in primary care for underserved populations. Dr. Binkiewicz is a dedicated educator and mentor who trains medical students and residents in various areas such as physical diagnosis, clinical skills, transition of care, and health disparities. But today, uh, Dr. Kinkiewicz will be presenting a talk to us entitled 
engineering, patient-oriented clinical handbooks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you. So in internal medicine, uh, residents have their own primary care patients that they take care of during the duration of their residency. Uh, when they graduate, these patients have to go to another provider, and it's often another resident physician. This also occurs in family medicine, pediatrics, and psychiatry, and it's estimated that over, overall a, about a million patients a year um, in the United States are transferred uh, due to resident graduation. Um, the ACGME, which is the main governing board for graduate medical education, um, does require that residents get trained in handoff communications and that programs monitor to make sure that there's good safety during handoffs. Um, however, at this point, most handoff education and uh, safety work has been focused on inpatient handoffs and not clinic handoffs. So there has been some work uh, identifying that there are risks to patients that occur during these clinic handoffs. And specifically, it's been found, um, you know, often the patients are handed off to a resident who's less experienced and may not be as able to take care for them. Um, also, there's stress on the ancillary staff when multiple people are transitioned at the same time. There can be an ownership problem as uh, the patients are taken over for by physicians who haven't yet met them. And there's also delays in care that occur. Um, patients can get lost to follow up and not come back to the clinic. Study results often get missed as they're ordered by the old physician. The new physician doesn't necessarily get the results on time. And then even it's been documented that there's increased use of acute care during the handoff period, so in the emergency room in the hospital. And here at the University of Chicago, when we looked at our own patients, we saw that uh, about a third of them uh, missed the first visit with their new provider right after the handoff and didn't see someone right away. And also about a fifth of them didn't come back for care at all in six months. Um, despite the fact that we know that there's a lot of risks to patients, nobody has really looked into kind of the patient side of this uh, handoff, specifically what the perspectives of the patients are or how to make it more patient-centered. So basically, the goal of the project, uh, with the help of the Buxbaum Institute, has been to uh, actually get suggestions uh, for a patient-centered handoff from patients who underwent a handoff. And then with this information to actually create a more patient-centered clinic handoff. Um, so to do that, we actually made a patient transition packet. And then also we made a teaching video and teaching tools for our residents to help them improve patient-centered care during this time. And then after this, our goal was to actually evaluate the impact of our tools on the process as well as patient outcomes. So we specifically looked at the patient awareness of the transition, um, if they missed visits with the new physician after uh, the handoff occurred, and if they were lost to follow up six months after the handoff and, and didn't come back for care. So uh, first we set out to find out what the patient's uh, perspective of the handoff was. And so what we did was we interviewed over 100 patients over the phone uh, three to four months afterwards in 2011 before we did anything and find out what the barriers they faced were and also any suggestions they had to make it more patient-centered. Um, and so we, and we identified several areas um, to focus on and uh, then decided to make the patient transition packet based on what we learned. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we found was very important was that we need to notify and prepare the patients for the handoff. They want to know what's going to happen ahead of time. Also, they uh, reported that having a telephone visit with the new doctor prior to meeting them in clinic was very, very helpful to them. And then also we realized giving guidance to residents on how to assume care in a patient-centered way was, was very critical. Um, also something that was interesting that uh, if we recognized patients for their role as actually trainee, um, educators of trainees, that seemed to help uh, them feel more understanding of the process and feel, feel more positively about it. And then at this, another thing that we found was personal sharing helped them build rapport with the new physician. So the idea of knowing something about the new doctor um, or even knowing something about their personal life, a personal event that happened uh, while they were in their care helped them uh, establish rapport with the doctor. Also empowering them during the transition so that they could be more active and uh, ensure that they got the, the results back and care that they needed was important as well. Uh, and so then based on this, we came up with a patient transition packet. 
um, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, so here are some examples of some of the things that the patients told us in the interviews. Um, so when I was transferred over, he, the new resident, had all the medical history from the old doctor. They went over it together. He went over it with me to see if everything was correct. So this is an example of a positive handoff that occurred. So when the two residents really worked together to convey the information and made the patient aware of that, the patient felt that the transition went a lot better. Uh, the next quotation is an example of personal sharing or this idea that um, knowing more personal information about their physician helped the patient um, feel more rapport with them. Uh, the doctors that I have had, they've given it their all. We've even got to talk about some personal things. My doctor was getting ready for her marriage when I talked to her on the phone. I told her, you're not supposed to be worried about your patients. Go, go, go get married. We'll talk when you get back. And so the patient really enjoyed that she kind of knew what was going on in her physician's life and felt a part of it. So as I mentioned, uh, with, with these findings, we made a patient transition packet. Yes, Obama's on here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, basically, this was uh, the first thing in the patient transition packet was a departure letter from the old physician um, saying goodbye to the patient, telling them where they were going, what they were doing. It was really important to the patients that they knew why they were leaving and what was happening. And then the, the new things that we added was um, a welcome letter from the new physician. So uh, this had the resident's picture. It has their phonetic spelling of their name to help the patient actually know how to pronounce it, which is very difficult often. Um, and then also we put in some personal information, where the uh, resident was from, um, where they were coming from, and also some of their hobbies and things like that um, to kind of help this personal sharing idea. Then in the packet, we also had um, a certificate of appreciation. So to the patient from the old resident saying thank you for helping my training and to recognize, and recognize them for their role in the training mission. Another thing we created was a, a preparation tool for the patient to help them get ready for the first visit so they could think about things that they needed to ask the physician for, um, medication refills, any test results that they may not have received to empower the patient in the process. And then basically we sent out this packet um, in 2012, two months before the handoff, and then we interviewed patients again uh, to look at their satisfaction with the process. We also performed chart review in 2011 and 2012 to look at patient outcomes. And overall, we found that um, after the pack packet, almost all, 99% of the patients were aware of the handoff, which was a very good thing. Um, however, only about half of them, or 44% of the patients, actually remembered getting the packet. So recall was not perfect. Uh, but this was also interviewed three to four months later after receiving it. Um, out of those who remembered, 70% uh, of them did say that it helped them build rapport with the new physician. It acknowledged their role as a teacher and helped them prepare for their first visit. As for the patient outcomes, we saw that um, fewer patients missed their first visit with the new provider after we implemented the packet um, from 2011 to 2012, and that was statistically significant. It went down from about 33% to uh, 20%. And then also there was a decrease in the amount of patients lost to follow-up after six months, um, which was also statistically significant. So our, overall, our conclusions from uh, the project so far are that when patients recalled the packet, they found it very effective and helpful during the transition, although the recall was suboptimal. Um, and overall, that a patient-centered clinic handoff was helpful to the patients, and we think it may have encouraged them to come back for care, so to go to the visit with the new provider right after the handoff and also not to get lost to follow up. Um, so one of the things, you know, we found there wasn't great recall of the packet. Um, part of that is due to our, the complexity of our patient population, social barriers, difficulty reaching them through the mail. Um, we decided one thing we'd do this year uh, as part of the Buxbaum pilot was make a comic um, about the handoff to try to dr uh, draw attention to the packet to improve recall, and also for patients who are older or may not have as um, high health literacy. Um, so we actually part partnered with a nurse who's a comic book artist and uh, made a comic book based on our patient interview data um, about the handoff and uh, also meant to uh, improve patient empowerment as well. And it's called Miss B Changes Doctors. Uh, it's something we also um, showed to our patients who were um, very vocal in the process and got feedback from them to um, improve it as well. And this is just an example of one of the panels that we put in there. This is kind of a, a panel to urge the patient to go to that first visit and establish care. Um, you know, the patient's talking about how she can't go to something because she has to go meet her new doctor. 
Then we also uh, worked on a teaching video, as I, I mentioned before, um, called Putting the Patient First. This is meant to be used with residents to help them assume care in a patient-centered way based on a lot of our findings in the patient interviews. Um, if you're interested, you can find it online. It's open um, publicly, uh, available publicly to those who would like to look at it. And we also made a checklist for educators um, to use this in workshops with trainees. We also made a pocket card that kind of shows patient, uh, uh, residents and educators um, patient-centered ways to assume care. And for the future directions of the product, project, basically um, we are going to mail out the comics this spring, hope that it's going to improve the recall of the packet, and we're going to reassess our effectiveness uh, with interviews with the patients. And then we're also disseminating a lot of our tools and our findings. We're doing a workshop at the program directors and internal medicine uh, meeting this spring. Um, with a bunch of medical educators. We're also going to use the new video and pocket card and resident teaching sessions here, as well as at Mercy and North Shore, um, and we'll see the effects of that. Um, and then we have a paper in press at the General uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine Medical Education issue that gives the um, findings from our original patient interviews about the barriers. So I'd like to acknowledge my um, contributors, as well as the Buxbaum Institute for their pilot funding. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. You can reach us at the email uh, listed there. And then once again, this is our teaching video email uh, website address. Thank you. So we do have, I didn't go into detail about it. We already have a protocol that we've implemented to improve the handoff system. So the residents meet and discuss the patients in a meeting and they do a handoff. Um, for them to actually see them at the same time, that's something we've thought about. It's very difficult to coordinate the resident schedules to do that. Um, but it is something we encourage the residents, if they're in clinic and the other resident is there, to go and bring them into the room and introduce them to the patient if they can. Um, but it ha it, you're, you bring up a good point. It would be great to do a joint visit. Um, and it's something we've tried to work out with the resident schedules, it's, it's very tough, but it, it would be ideal. And just to follow up, uh, would it be possible for the old resident to give, present the packet to them instead of mailing it to them? Uh, that, that is something we could do as well. Um, the issue is that some of the patients may not be seen until several months before the old resident leaves, so you may miss people, um, or if they miss the visit, you could miss people, but that is something we could do as well. And that, you're right, that may help. You know, we could have them available for them to give out as well and through the mail so they make sure we get, we get it to them somehow. Yeah. Uh, Amber, did you get a sense of whether involving um, caregivers or family members might, um, might help with the handoff process? Just having more sets of ears hearing information? Yeah, we haven't, uh, the mean age of the patients that are handed off, or the high risk patients that are handed off is 62. So you do bring up a good point. There may be some other family members involved. Um, we haven't looked into that as much, but that's a, a good thing to think about as well as involving them in the process. Mm -hmm. Do the packages that you send out in any way relate to the uh, diversity of the patients, such as sending a, a, a Spanish uh, package Spanish-speaking family, or were they all in English? They're, they're all in English at this time. Um, we don't have too many Spanish-speaking patients um, in the resident clinic, but that is something, you bring up a very good point. Uh, we have a couple of residents who do speak Spanish, <coughs> and we should work with them to do that. Mm -hmm. But in general, we have worked on making sure that the reading level um, is at a low level so it's easy for patients to read. Hi, Eva. Can you look at resident satisfaction as far as the pre and post intervention? Not for this packet yet. Um, that's something we've been doing with our uh, handoff protocol. Um, and, and we actually have improved resident satisfaction significantly through a lot of the work and training we've been doing. Um, we are going to look at the residents' uh, opinions of the patient centered teaching after we do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ross Miller, 
Dr. Milner. Dr. Milner was the uh, first master clinician appointed to the Buckingham Institute. Uh, Dr. Milner is a distinguished uh, uh, professor in the vascular surgery section of the Department of Surgery. Uh, his training was at the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed his residency and fellowship uh, in vascular surgery, and then came to the University of Chicago from Loyola, uh, where he had been the, uh, the chief chief of vascular surgery and uh, uh, quickly distinguished himself at the University of Chicago. He's co-directed the Center of Aortic Diseases and uh, the, pre the first Buckscott Master Clinician, Dr. Miller. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark, thank you very much, and uh, I have master clinician on the slide, but uh, it should be clinicians now, and I apologize for that typo. So part of this is going to be personal experience, and part of this is going to actually show you a little bit of an action plan, but I need to give you a little bit of a history to make this, I think, relevant, and I think pertinent to the talks that were given earlier this afternoon, I think you'll see some of this in the experience I've had so far in, in my career hopefully with many more years uh, like the experience that you heard earlier. But I was sitting in uh, my condo early in the uh, afternoon of Saturday, September 29th, a beautiful fall day in Chicago, and doing what I'm not supposed to be doing when I'm having family time and checking my email. And get this. And I start to read this, and I'm a little bit perplexed because I had no idea that this, number one, was even relevant to me. And number two, as I'm reading it, I'm very sort of surprised because I'm like, wow, this sounds like it's a relatively big deal. Why is this even pertinent to me? And I keep reading, and it sounds really great. So I sort of have this reaction, which is none because I'm shocked. And then my next question is, me? A surgeon, the first master clinician for the University of Chicago? That doesn't seem right. So why is this relevant to the talk? Because like any good son and now a father as well, I called my mother and father and told them that I got this. And of course, what's the first question my dad asked me? <laughs> so I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. So that's why it's relevant to this talk. So I guess my first role, quote unquote, was to smile and look pretty on a website, which I tried to do to the best of my ability. But I realized the real first role was being a mentor. So I took this off dictionary.com, which may not be the best place to get information, but I think gives you a good idea. So what's a mentor? A wise and, tr wise and trusted counselor or teacher, an influential senior sponsor or supporter, and it can also be used as a verb with two different meanings as a verb. So I think mentorship clearly is part of the reason. But I think I have to take you back a little bit of my background. How, did, uh, I was, how was I impacted by my mentors and why did it impact me and my career in a way that I think that I've become a good mentor? Well, as you heard from Mark, actually my training is even further back at Penn than he mentioned. So I went to college at Penn. I did medical school at Penn, surgical residency at Penn. And if you're surprised, I actually did my vascular surgery fellowship at Penn as well. So I spent 16 years at the University of Pennsylvania. It was an amazing place. There's a lot of similarities between this, inti this institution and that institution in a very positive way. This slide brought back a lot of memories for me and also uh, some sadness as I put it together because as I looked, several of my mentors have unfortunately passed away. But uh, these are five people that had a tremendous impact on my life as a surgeon. Uh, on the top left of the screen is Ron Fairman, who's chief of vascular surgery at Penn who I was his first fellow when he became chief. And it's clearly when I thought about where I wanted to be in my career, I want to be Ron Fairman. And I still want to be Ron Fairman. He is an amazing doctor and is a true role model for surgeons in training. On the top right is Leonard Miller, who was chairman of surgery at Penn many, many years ago and used to run what was the ward service uh, when the residents did all the operating and uh, was really a, uh, a strong advocate for students and residents. Dr. Rosado on the bottom left 
left, uh, really taught me how to operate, and he was, I believe, the fast, first master clinician at the University of Pennsylvania under the Rabden Award, who was also a surgeon, and he truly was a master clinician. And for me to think that I have a similar title now is a little bit challenging because Dr. Rosado really is the master clinician. Dr. Busby on the bottom right was a great mentor, and in the middle is my old chairman of surgery, Clyde Barker, who is just the consummate academic surgeon. After I finished my training at Penn, I went to uh, Holland for six months and really met the person who turned out to be my true mentor, and that's Jan Blankenstein. Jan, Jan is an unbelievable academic vascular surgeon, got me started on my academic career, and has now transitioned from what I perceive to be sort of my best advocate to one of my best friends, and we see each other frequently in meetings around the world and spend a lot of time together. My family just vacationed in Europe, and uh, was, we were able to spend some time with him together as a family, which is always very special. So back to what do you do uh, as a master clinician in the Bucks bomb? Well, I think it's that we provide an environment for trainees to excel and learn to be great doctors who care about their patients. So in addition, I think we need to provide an example of what it means to have a work-life balance because I think that's what makes us great physicians. So how have I done that at least so far in my career? As Mark said, I've had the privilege of being very involved with the Center for Aortic Diseases, and uh, there's other people in this audience who have been very involved in what we've done. So why is this relevant? This brings together, I think, what the Bucks Bomb stands for. This is a multi-specialty collaborative group that works together to take care of the most complicated problems that patients have. We do an amazingly good job of working together at specialties and taking great care of very complicated patients. And it brings a lot of people together. This is a photograph taken before I even started working here as we were trying to get people to understand how successful we can be as a multi-specialty group. There's interventional cardiologists, there's cardiac surgeons, there's anesthesia doctors, there's cardiologists who have a special interest in the genetic diseases involved with uh, aortic uh, problems. Uh, what's left out here, and I apologize, is our ER colleagues who have been amazingly helpful in uh, caring for our patients, and really, Linda's been unbelievably involved in our program. Most of you in the room will look at this and be like, what in the world? And the reason I show this is this is a very complicated uh, aneurysm repair that we do with a uh, completely endovascular approach, which up until a few years ago wasn't even feasible. And I show this because this is what our program allows, taking care of the most complicated patients and doing it in a way that we get great outcomes. So how do we provide the model? Again, what are we doing as mentors? This uh, patient is someone who had a mesenteric bypass done for chronic mesenteric ischemia, who was told in multiple places she could not tolerate surgery and should just go home and not uh, just do the best she can because she really won't survive with her problem. Did a mesenteric bypass for her. She did great. I just saw her back actually earlier this week, almost a year removed from her operation, and she's unbelievably grateful. This is what we should be doing. So work-life balance. Here's my family. Uh, I've been married uh, 16 years. I met my wife when I was a second year medical student. Uh, as you heard earlier, she's, I agree, she's sort of my, uh, my in-house psychiatrist as well as an unbelievable uh, counselor. She's great at giving me good advice. Uh, my son, Jake, who is actually, since his picture was taken, I think is taller than I am now, which I hate to admit. And my little daughter, Callie, who's got the personality of uh, about five little girls. Uh, this is in uh, Prague just recently from a vacation. I bring this up for the same reasons that Amber did. Uh, many of my patients who I saw before I went on vacation had surgery sort of scheduled around my vacation. And when I came back, every single one of them specifically asked how my vacation was. So what else do you do for work-life balance? Well, I like to run. Uh, this is last year from the Soldier Field 10-mile run. I'm not a great runner, but it gives me peace of mind. It lets me clears my head, and that lets me be, I think, the best surgeon I can be. So what about the next generation of physicians? So I've been uh, very honored to be involved with Joel Schwab uh, from uh, the Bucksbaum Institute looking at our clinical excellence track initiative that we're doing with the undergraduate school. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but this is at least that you see that it's not just um, sort of my personal experiences that have gotten to this point, but trying to give back and trying to get the students the best opportunity to become the best physicians they can. This is a collaboration between the undergraduate school, the medical center, and the Bucksbaum Institute, trying to get students into an opportunity to have a clinical excellence track and understand what it means, the doctor-patient relationship, and to be a great physician. So what do we do as part of the Bucksbaum? Well, we're involved with on being a doctor series, which has been coordinated by Dr. Schwab. 
We are, will have students come into the different uh, public lectures that Mark arranges that are fantastic and as well get them involved with different programs. But I think what we really are going to be involved with is a volunteer and shadowing program and it will be the Buxbaum master clinicians and senior scholars I think that can provide some of the most amazing mentorship for these students as they look for their next step of their training after undergraduate school. Uh, so this is what we'd like to do, be available for on being a doctor, host pre-medical students during the shadowing program, and mentor groups of students. So where do I think, what do I think the role is? I think I have a better idea now, and next time I speak to my dad, I can give him a better sense of what I do. But the role is clearly an evolution, and I think we're trying to understand how we can work best with every aspect of the medical center, with the undergraduate school, and there's things that we can do in a very positive way. I say keep on keeping on because I think the reality is all of the uh, physicians who have been honored with these responsibilities and roles so far got these because they are great mentors uh, and deserve that reputation and will continue to do what they do to be great mentors. We need to engage rising physicians, possibly extend to lab or other high school students to give them opportunities in the early part of their career. And one of the things which I am torturing Mark with, which I will continue to torture him until he says yes to me, is we need to provide a forum to aid physicians in training who are struggling with professionalism. That's something I think we need to do. We don't know how to do it yet, and we need to do better with it. So Mark, Matt, and Angela, thank you very much. And obviously to the Bucks Bombs, thank you very much. This has been a great honor. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, I, I asked, uh, I asked Ross as the first master clinician to try to define the role because we, we, we hadn't quite defined it ourselves and, uh, and, and the presentation uh, really helped us along. Mike, I hope it helps you too. <laughs> nice to meet you. It's Dr. Bishop and I haven't met yet, so it's nice to see you. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, hello, my name is Chris Brown, I'm a first year medical student here at Chester. I wonder if you could share what are some of the um, core experiences that we as medical students have tried to take advantage of in our training before we become residents? I'm not sure I have a, a good answer to that. I think, uh, you know, it partly depends on what your interests are. There's so many different opportunities here to take advantage of. I think you have to figure out what interests you and then make some decisions from there. I'm not sure I have a straightforward answer to that. I'm sorry, I think this stopped. Can you hear? Is this working? What about, uh, aside from trainees, and, you know, the, the people in the back of this pamphlet are all going to be great, hopefully great role models for trainees. There's a lot of other physicians that serve as mentors. And um, is, there, is there an opportunity to engage current physicians? Um, this kind of thing wouldn't be lost on them. Um, do, you know, you know, do you mean, do you mean for which part, well, for I mean, the? Rama, Rama earlier talked about kind of the negative attitudes that, that, um, that trainees will see um, out on the floors. And, and coming up with a plan to maybe address that or, try to provide some kind of an outlet to for those negative attitudes so they're just, you know, they're, there's, there's other ways of venting those feelings and, and promoting professionalism and, and humanism among people that are already trained and, and in practice. Not, you know, and I don't mean to say to imply that this is what's happening, but not writing off um, physicians that are already in practice. I think that's fair. That's not one of, so one of the things that I talked to Mark about and as the institute's evolving, trying to figure out how that'll work best I, I, I don't, is how that's going to work best is the, uh, what I looked at talking to Mark about was for residents who are struggling with this for right now because they can be impacted the most. For people that are already in practice, I think that's a little bit more challenging and the paradigms don't really exist very well, but I think it would be very relevant to anybody who's struggling and I think we uh, can provide a great model for people who are struggling. We just need to figure out the right way to identify them and provide them appropriate training and feedback that they can continue to grow. And obviously as people are in their training, it's an easier time to do it than when they're already in practice, but I think it's obviously very, very relevant to them as well. Is that we think is that what we've done with medical students really could apply to residents and people beyond residency in practice. A couple of years ago, I was invited by the, uh, someone on the faculty of North Shore Hospital to come to what they call the Nostler Society meeting. Once a month, they have students, house staff, and attendings on a voluntary basis come for dinner and a, and a talk. It's about a two-hour session. 
and I was invited to give a talk, but I was very impressed with the communication that took place across the lines. It was an opportunity, again, like a midnight meal. It took place between six and eight, but I think that a lot of attendings, once they get out of their training, no longer have the option or the opportunity to talk. And I know that uh, up in, the, in the Northampton, not Northampton, uh, Williams, Massachusetts, where I spoke once, I learned that there was a group of physicians in the neighboring towns that was actually paying a facilitator to meet with them once a month to have these kind of discussions. I think the, the option should be, you might think about the option of having groups like that for people who've already finished their formal training. I think it's a great suggestion. I think for me, I have uh, one partner who I'm very good friends with that is a great sounding board and we discuss complicated problems together and when things haven't gone well in the operating room and whatnot, but I'm not sure everybody has that opportunity and I think your suggestion is a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for, to the Buckstone Institute, the advisory board, and our leadership for um, giving us this opportunity to talk. I'm going to sort of talk a little bit sort of about the background about this because our pilot program has been up and running, but before I present a lot of the data, I wanted to kind of put it into perspective, and I hope I can not drop all of these recording devices. So um, in general, let me see if I can. Oops. Uterine cancer or endometrial cancer is the, the, a pretty common cancer in women. It's not as common as breast cancer or lung colorectal, but it's number four, and it's about 50,000 cases a year that we see. In terms of deaths due to uterine or endometrial cancer, it's actually a cancer that a lot of women can survive with, which is a great thing. And sometimes we sort of think of it as amongst our cancers when we compare it to ovarian cancer, which can be often much more lethal. Sort of the people kind of talk about it as the good cancer to get. If you have to get a GYN cancer, uterine cancer is usually cured by surgery alone. The, it's the most common one we see as GYN oncologists. It's the most common surgery that I do. Um, epidemiologically, the death rate is rising from endometrial cancer. The, the incidence is rising, and this is really a combination of the aging of the population and the um, increasing obesity in our population, which is the major risk factor for endometrial cancer. In general, the ge general mean age is about 62, so this is generally a cancer that affects postmenopausal women, um, but younger and younger women are affected by it as well. So this is just show, sort of showing that the, as we go over time, a lot of the um, epidemiological data has demonstrated that this, the incidence alone is rising, which is become, making us busier. And one of the things that's also rising that I can sort of see even in, in, in my shorter type um, frame of practice is the complexity of the health issues that these patients are coming with to our practice the endometrial cancer is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. They're coming with a lot of other medical problems that are related to the risk of why they develop this cancer, and these are the problems that are going to haunt them after they've been treated for their cancer. 
So one of the biggest risk factors is obesity, and to just put it in perspective, if you're 50 pounds overweight, that puts you at a relative risk of 10 times the normal for developing endometrial cancer. And a lot of my patients are very surprised, and I think in Chicago, we get a little bit used to larger patients with BMIs that are larger, and we don't, we sort of normalize that. And we forget that, you know, somebody who's 5'5 should not weigh 250 pounds, but sometimes I'm actually thrilled that the person weighs less than 300 pounds. You know, it becomes part of the norm, and I think that's something really important to address. So a lot of some of these epidemiological factors are things that you may not be able to change, but diabetes and hypertension are also independent risk factors aside from obesity for development of this. And this is due to the biological fact that endometrial cancer is a estrogen-driven, obesity-related cancer. Um, about 75 to 80% of women who develop endometrial cancer are obese. And this number has changed in the statistics as we've gone along as well. And this is probably historically and sort of pathophysiologically one of the first cancers that was very estrogen driven as well as very obesity driven that everyone sort of accepted as a common risk factor. So most women who undergo surgery have an excellent cancer prognosis. So the majority of women will have low risk disease. They will be cured potentially from their surgery alone. And sometimes getting them through their surgery because of their comorbidities is, is one of our biggest challenges. Um, in fact, though, the problem is that once we get them through the surgery, these women are actually not dying of their cancer after we care for them. They're dying of all of these other problems. They're dying of cardiovascular disease, obesity-related disease, diabetes complications, and that's something that is um, more and more important. So this is just sort of incidence rates by rates as well, because I think this is another portion of our research um, program and some of this, the initial pro program for environment endometrial cancer survivors in general, in that um, when you look at the difference between white and black women who are developing um, endometrial cancer, white women are still more likely to develop the endometrial cancer, but when you look at deaths due to the endometrial cancer, black women, African American women are much more likely to die of their disease. And that is something that's been striking and has been seen in a lot of different types of studies, both in terms of looking at clinical trials, both in terms of looking at SEER data, which is a population base. And that's something that a lot of different investigators from genetics to molecular biology to um, more um, public policy in terms of access to care have been looking at. And it's a very, it's, it's a very hard thing to piece together, but there have been some things such as, you know, less access to surgery, less access to surgical staging, less treatment post-surgery. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these things, but in general, when you look at sort of race and state, race and age as a factor, you can see the difference really shows up in our older women population as we are seeing more and more of these women in terms of how women are surviving who are diagnosed with endometrial cancer or uterine cancer. And this again is also is also the case for um, stage. So even local, um, there's even in early stage patients, there's a difference. One of the really interesting studies that came out this last year was a study that was a 20-year sort of longitudinal study looking at causes of death of patients who had had endometrial cancer. And what this really found was that in the first five years, your endometrial cancer probably contributed to a great deal of deaths, especially in these higher grade histologies or advanced stage disease. But in patients who had low risk disease and they survived five years, their cardiovascular risk just continued to decline. And so at five years, a low risk patient who had their endometrial cancer really is somebody who's going to die of something else. And this is sort of the same sort of annual frequencies of where their cardiovascular deaths are, which I think is very critical because this is something that comes up and that we don't necessarily address in our patient population. One of the ironies that we, you know, as training in oncology, you go over a lot of clinical trials and you go a lot of, of, a lot of like trial endpoint design. And one of the unspoken things when you go back and look at some of our seminal literature in GYN oncology, there's this one liner somewhere saying, almost 50% of patients died of intercurrent disease before the study was completed, so you're not even getting your treatment effects um, really um, looked at. So I think this is where this sort of came from, is that we are helping them survive from their cancer, but are we actually helping them survive overall? Are we helping them thrive in any way? And this really came, the research project came as a result of what are we doing for these survivors? There's thought to be about 600,000 women who are survivors of uterine cancer. About 85% of them are gonna be cured of their disease, and the other 10% or 15% will be patients who have recurrent 
um, endometrial cancer. And one of the things that we really, I wanted to really focus on was that is, could this be sort of a teachable moment for these patients and their extended family? A lot of these women are the centers of their family. They come to their new patient visit and they come to their post-surgical visits with their daughters, their granddaughters, their extended family. And we're all sort of, you know, have this moment where they're very concerned about their cancer. And this may be a moment for us to say, well, the cancer was actually sort of a end stream result of your obesity. And that's what's the, what's the biggest risk factor. So our um, initial project, it, you know, kind of really centers around, I'm not really good at PowerPoint, but it centers around a lot of themes of the disparity that was related to race, obesity, this idea of cancer survivorship that I think is gaining more and more um, importance, and a little bit about cancer prevention, though I think that's harder to really say that we're doing. This is a, um, a qualitative sort of patient-based approach to try to figure out what do our patients think about this. If we've sort of addressed that they, they are obese, they need lifestyle changes, what do they think? Do they think this is a problem? And so the, this, um, the pilot funding that we received from the Buxbaum Institute allowed me to kind of create a focus group model of looking at um, this, this question. So our objective was to understand and um, describe knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors relating to obesity and life, healthy lifestyles among African American women who have been diagnosed and treated for their endometrial cancer as well as sort of their social cohorts. So they actually are women who are helping us recruit either peers or family members who want to kind of participate in these focus groups and they've been very well received. Really we want to sort of help get clinicians to help guide them, how should we be having these conversations? What do our patients really want to know? And what should we be telling them? And this is tough from a cancer perspective because we're very used to seeing these patients in a quick follow-up and that we do their pelvic exams and they're religious about coming for their pelvic exams. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're expanding what we can tell them about. So we're basically looking at focus groups, um, African American women above the age of 40 and their female family members. These are sort of some of the different domains and the, the domains and the qualitative research guide was, was, was designed with a lot of different people who've done a lot of qualitative research, but the in general domains are really helping us hear from our patients. So defining healthy lifestyle, seeing if weight loss and weight management is realistic or are there too many competing, competing um, priorities. In general, making change in, ab, in eating habits or activity level, best approaches to learning about and maintaining healthy weight, so there's a lot of different domains that we're interested in, including a formal weight management program, as well as specifics that we're sort of targeting what the experience of the endometrial cancer patients or how did having a, patient, a family member with this um, make a difference as well. So we, we spent a lot of time designing the qualitative instrument to be used. We have spent a lot of time recruiting our participants. We've, we have done two or the three planned focus groups already, and they've been very interesting in terms of the transcriptions we've hear, heard. And we're sort of in the process of data coding and analysis of sort of the themes that, that are emerging. Um, and I think that that's been very exciting and very um, different for me from being, you know, uh, mostly doing surgery. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very new field for me, but very, very exciting nonetheless. Um, I'm very excited because I think the, the Bucksbaum funding was the first funding that we got to do in this project and subsequently we've actually been funded by the American Cancer Society Illinois Division for a two-year grant to kind of create a pilot program around this and we're actually starting to enroll patients in a, who are cancer survivors and their family members in a longitudinal um, community-based program that Mercy has. So I'm not an expert in how patients should, what they should eat and what they should always do but um, the Mercy program that we are collaborating with really does have a very sustained program and our goal is ultimately to sort of a ra a ra a raise awareness in, in our group of patients that we see. So thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Lee? Yes. Right there, right? So um, can you just comment on how you found your own style in talking with uh, 
Um, yeah, I think it's hard because you don't want to you don't want to embarrass the patient. You don't want to make anybody feel bad about it. But I think the way I bring it up is a little bit of you know a lot of patients who get their cancer want to know why this happened to them. You know, and I usually start by saying, well, all of us have risk factors, and uh, most patients actually think, well, I don't understand because I, it doesn't run in my family. That's the biggest thing. Um, and I usually start by saying, well, all of us who carry extra weight have other risk factors that this weight can affect on your body, and then we kind of start to have this conversation about um, obesity. My, my, one of my PAs who work with me has created a dot phrase and epic for my obesity <laughs> talk now. But I think really establishing that this is sort of a bigger picture of their uh, overall health care as opposed to saying, okay, I'm your cancer doctor and that's the only thing we're going to focus on and you know, kind of sort of say, okay, after you're done with your surgery, we dodged a bullet, your cancer was a very, you know, hopefully a good prognostic you know, factor. But now really being quite honest with them and a little bit blunt about saying this isn't going to be what actually make, makes you, you know, makes, becomes life threatening to you, even though cancer is the scarier word. Um, so I think it's really not being, not being afraid to really say it out loud, which I think is really hard because you don't want to, you know, you don't, I think there's this tendency to not want to make your patients uncomfortable and you don't want to, but I think you can do it if you sort of put it in a spectrum of if you want to look out for their whole you know, whole being, this is going to be a factor. And the family history thing, I love that question because I'm saying, well, actually, it doesn't run in families because of genetics, but if all of you are overweight or if everybody's diet is the same, it will run in families. And we do have uh, several families who've, oh, the same thing happened to my mom when she was 50, and now it's happening to me. So it's kind of a, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. In, in light of the uh, recent study of uh, uh, people who have allergies and the role of adherence and humanistic trusting relationships with your doctor, mm -hmm. are you considering adding that dimension to this study, the relationship? You know, we haven't, the study doesn't have a portion of the relationship to the doctor, although I think we're taking advantage of that because we really want to have GYN oncologists to be sort of the, the introducers of this idea because I think we do spend a lot of time with our patients and because our patients um, trust us to have gotten them through a surgery where they had a lot of cardiovascular risk, we have a lot of patient conversations sometimes around surgeries that are more complex. So we're trying to use it that way. The other thing would be that in the next sort of phase would be sort of involving their primary care physician so that, you know, in, in our project, all of the primary care physicians are notified that their patients are going to be in this program and what our goals are. But I think that that is very true in terms of the, having that conversation. You have to have a good rapport to be able to be really honest with your patient to say this is what, you know, the reality is. So. Thank you. So much. Thank you.